I am super excited about today's episode. If you guys know anything about me, you know I love behavioral psychology, why humans do what humans do. And my guest today is Dr. Heather McKee. She is a behavioral change psychologist who specializes in helping people make new habits stick. She's got over 10 years of research under her belt. She is phenomenal. You guys are going to be blown away, and we're going to give you some tactical strategies and tools that you can use to help make all of your new habits, all of those powerful, positive, abundance-level habits stick so that you don't have to stay on that roller coaster. All right, enjoy the show. Heather, thank you for joining the podcast today, all the way from Dublin, Ireland. You've, I think you're my first Irish uh, guest, so welcome. Amazing. Well, it's an honor to be here. Yeah, I love it. I actually have some clients that actually live in Ireland, and then I've got really? some local clients here in California that are actually from Ireland. So um, I think it's probably very kismic that we're on the we're on the the chat today. Yeah. Oh no, it's lovely to be able to. Uh um you know reach to large audience as well for you um you know I know that you do across all across the world so I'm excited to be here yeah and if my audience knows that I am a I'm fascinated by a clinical psychology and human behavior and why humans do what they do before we jump into that um I you know I've already told everybody in the intro that you are a behavioral change psychologist is that kind of your is that your specialty would you say um, yeah, health behavior change. Yeah, health behavior change. I love that because mm. you're listening to my show. You're all about making some, and even me, I'm interested in making like healthy behavioral changes. How'd you get here? Like, how's your? What's the story? Like, how did how did you find this path in life? Yeah, great question. Um, not in a straight line, <laughs> which is normal. Definitely, yeah, <laughs> definitely in a squiggly line. Um, I think I've always been fascinated when I think back even to as a child I've always been fascinated by human behavior you know like my, my favorite part of a magazine was you know that back page where it was like a day in the life and what what someone's life was like from the moment they get up to yeah. the evening and um I think originally I was quite interested in well-being but back then it was it was more about actually sports was the was the kind of vehicle for well-being it was less like now which like fitness is a sport now you know right. um and uh, when I started studying it um it was much more about sports psychology and performance and and everything else and then over the years um things have shifted and and, and my studies then shifted um alongside that but what really kind of got me excited and I think it's quite a similar um kind of purposes as, as you have James was uh, I was working in a metabolic syndrome clinic so it was a clinic for people with diabetes and heart disease and um, various different um, elements of metabolic syndrome and we had the most amazing trainers we had the most perfect nutritional plans but no one seemed to be able to be doing that well and, 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 you know, and it baffled me coming from this background where I'd studied nutrition and I'd studied exercise and sports science. And I was like, I don't understand. Like you have everything here, you know, why aren't things happening? And um, I ended up sitting down with all 60 people in the clinic uh, one to one um, and asking them, you know, what's going on for you? You know, what's holding you back? And that was really what ignited the flame that got me interested in behavioral change because it was like each person's you know reasons were different they were complex there were so many psychological barriers and um, that it was so much more than just giving people the ingredients of change um, and yeah that's what got me really excited and then I went on to study um, you know the psychology of weight loss how do we lose weight without dieting how do we use psychology um, and harness it as a skill for change um, and yeah I was just fascinated ever since. That is awesome. I mean, I, I would be so intrigued by that as well. I mean, just the opportunity, because I, you know, I shared with you before we started a very kind of a similar experience. I was, you know, and I always tell people like, we don't need another diet, right? We don't need another nutrition program. We don't need another like fitness program. Like there's no perfect, any of that. Mm -hmm. And and in today's world, like you can literally fall down and land on, like you said, the perfect nutrition or the perfect trainer or the perfect, all that. But unless you couple that with psychology mindset and, and work through all of those things, 
you're going to end up back where you started. Like I always find this, and you tell me with your with your clinical and your, your vast experience. That's kind of the thing. So I I use fitness and nutrition as a way to get people into my world, right? Because mm-hmm. nobody nobody ever calls me up and says, "Hey, I really want to work on my mindset so that I can lose <laughs> weight," right? Like it doesn't work in that in that format. It's always like, yeah. "Hey, Jay, I want to lose fifty pounds." Mm. And I want to do it by eating better and working out. They never, you know, they never add the mindset piece to that, right? So whenever you were listening to these 60 people kind of give it to you, like, was it just like this aha moment? Like how, can you give me like a, a, like, was there one specific story or moment that stood out to you like a slap in the face? That is so interesting. What a great question. Um, well, as you're speaking though, two thoughts came up before I answer that, which was, you know, and something that you say a lot, and I and I've seen in, in previous podcasts of yours and, and, and publications and pieces about, you know, like how many of us don't know we need to eat more vegetables or sleep more or drink right. more water or move more or manage our stress, you know, and 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 yet we we seek out these things when we're looking to lose weight. We're thinking, okay, well, I just need that perfect nutrition plan or that perfect exercise plan. But it's not information that we're lacking, it's implementation that we're Absolutely. lacking. Absolutely. And, and and that's where the gap is. And I call it or they call it in psychology, the intention action gap. It's like we have all the best intentions in the world, but it's taking action where we get held up. And, and that's certainly what I saw in those um in those people, you know, it's, it's not information, it's implementation that's missing. Um, and, 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 you know, they knew what to do. It was just that something was holding them back. And, and when we kind of was, were able to unlock that something, that was when the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Yeah. And each person had their something, you know, maybe it happened to be, you know, um, a childhood trauma, or maybe it happened to be a partner that was supportive of change, or maybe it happened to be that, you know, they were in a job that they didn't love and they had a really tough boss and they're finding that really difficult. Um, and often, you know, it's quite interesting. It wasn't really anything that you think would be directly related to the weight loss. Yeah. Um, but yet it was something that was hanging around in their non-conscious brain that they just had, it was unresolved. Um, you know, for a lot of people, it was a confidence issue. Um, for the people, it might have been something that happened, you know, that was a comment someone had made just once. And, um, you know, once we started to talk about it, once we kind of started to unravel those layers, there was always something for each person. Um, and that's what I found fascinating, because it's almost like you have to be a bit of a behavioral detective. Yeah. You know, you've got to, like, look for what all the clues are and, you know, um, interview people in a way that actually promotes and supports um that curiosity and understanding and then you know shine the light for them on that evidence and help them see you know a way through it yeah I totally agree I think you know that being the detective portion of that is so crucial because it's like I said nobody wants to show up and tell you about a trauma or 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 a a lack of confidence or any of those Mm. things and you you hit the nail on the head like we are all the way. I always, I make the joke like, all right, I'm going to give you a quiz. And if you get all the answers right, you get a million dollars, right? Everybody would get the million dollars. If, if it was like a basic nutrition quiz or should I go work out or should I sit on the couch? Should mm-hmm. I eat donuts or should I have a salad? Like we don't need, you're perfectly, you said that perfectly. Like, we don't need more information. It's it's the the gap in the middle that we need to get bridged. But people don't mm-hmm. show up and say, hey, I've got this situation or this trauma or this lack of belief. Mm. And therefore that's what's causing me to be overweight or need to need to lose weight. Yeah. They show up with the really the superficial stuff because the other stuff is so challenging to talk about. Mm. Can you, in your experience, like, have you noticed that as well? Like the first thing that they present to you is not usually the thing that needs the most help. It's like, yeah. you have to kind of dig. And the interesting thing is actually that you talk about that. I think people themselves don't really realize what their true motivation is. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, my motivation is to lose X amount of weight. That's not a motivation. That's an outcome. That's a number. Um, And so often, like, and I'm sure you see this all the time when it comes to creating any change in our life, we always focus on 
the numbers. So like the number on our paycheck, the number on the scales, the number we're able to lift on the gym. Mm-hmm. And, and that can only motivate us short term. And in psychology, it's known as extrinsic motivation. And I call it slippy motivation because it's very hard to hang on to. Yeah. And if that's your sole motivator, that's only going to last for a couple of weeks. And that tends to be why a lot of people after that six to eight week mark tend to fall off the wagon and they go back to, you know, the baseline or even, you know, often, you know, worse than they were before. Um, And what I often try and do with people at the very, very start, and, um, you know, you've probably heard a quote on this Simon Sinek, which says, start with why. Yeah. Start with why does it matter to you? Why is it important to you to create this change in your life? And, And what that does is it invokes intrinsic motivation which is sticky motivation and intrinsic is a beautiful word jay it's um translates into latin into inward or goods for the soul Mm. and i absolutely love that word because it's all about like you know so often we come to lifestyle changes doing it for someone else doing it for our doctor doing it for our spouse doing it for our kids doing it for our grandchildren whoever else we stop if we stop for a second and ask ourselves, is that our true motivation? Is that going to keep us going in the trenches? Ultimately, all the research from psychology shows us no. Right. We're doing it for external, extrinsic reasons like numbers or someone else or for performance or appearance or all of the likes on social media. That's only going to last short term. What we need to do is we need to really unlock our why and unlock what the true intrinsic drivers are. And one way to do that is to ask yourself a very simple question is why is it important for me to make this change and keep asking yourself why so someone might say okay my goal is to walk 10k 10,000 steps on my fitness tracker each day and you could say but why because I want to feel fitter but why because I want to feel more confident in myself but why because it's important for me um, to feel confident in my life because then I can apply myself more in my work or I can be a better role model as a parent or I can better represent my community. And if you keep asking yourself, you can do this with yourself. You ask yourself why enough. You often get to that core, that true, that intrinsic why. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing to unlock because when you find your why, you can find your way. And that's really, really important in terms of creating those lifelong sustainable changes. I could not agree more. I I, ha- I have these conversations with myself all the time. I even ask myself, you know, in, in the, the form of the why, like, why do I believe that, right? Because I think a lot of times we have these, like, we have these belief systems that really aren't serving us because we've created them to protect ourselves. And so I ask myself that question all the time. Like, if I have this belief about why I'm doing something, I always like to ask a deeper question and say, well, why do I believe that? Like, why do I believe that that has value? And so I think if we can attach value to things, right, like, especially from like the internal perspective, then the likelihood of of us continuing that are amazing. I love how you talk about like the stickiness of habits, like it's got to be sticky versus slippery. And so uh, let's dive a little deeper into that, because how, how does someone, you know, anchor or make a habit sticky? Because I think, like you said earlier, it's not the intention. We have the best intentions as humans. Mm. It's the gap. It's that intention action gap. Like, so how do we bridge that gap? How do we start to build that bridge? Yeah. Oh, wonderful question. Um, Well, I'd like to say, first of all, that it takes time. And and I, I, and I mean that in a way that I don't want to put people off. You know, so many people always say to me, like, how many days does it take to form a habit? You know, and a lot of people say 21, 28 days or, and, 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 you know, the research shows it can take anything between 18 and 254 days to create a habit. Yeah, it's so vast. Yeah. It's so vast, so variable. And like, it depends on the complexity of the habit and, 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 and I say, ultimately, whether it takes 18 or 254 days, if you're creating habits that are of a, are of a lifetime, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what's key is that you do it in a way that's important, like, you know, based on intrinsic motivation, but also in a way that's going to make it simpler and easier for you to create those habits. Um, and I think that's one thing that's really important is actually to start with simplicity, because 
when it comes to creating habits, we so often think, okay, you know, New Year rolls around and we're like, right, I'm going to give up sugar. I'm going to give up alcohol. I'm going to start saving. I'm going to be nice to my kids. I'm going to do all of the things. And the more we add in, the more we actually take away from our focal goal. And that's a concept in psychology called goal dilution. So the more you add in, the more you take away from your long-term success. And the thing is, this is because willpower is like a muscle. So, you know, if we go to the gym for the next week and I just train my right bicep, by the time I get to the ne- the end of the week, I wouldn't even be able to pick up a cup of tea, you know? Right. But if I went once a week for seven weeks, that's much more habit forming than going for seven days in a row. And it's actually a much kinder way of being with yourself as well. Uh-huh. But it's also preserving your willpower. And so, you know, if willpower is like a muscle or it's like sand running through an hourglass, you know, it depletes over time. So we need to give a proper rest and recovery for it to get strong. But by kind of coming out all guns blazing out the gates and trying to do everything all at once, it's ineffective. But that's how we we often, you know, we expect these overnight transformations. We expect to throw everything at it and something will stick. But actually what we've seen in habit science is doing the opposite is much more effective yeah. it's those small changes that actually lead to those kind of longer term lasting results and when I mean small I mean like I often say you know if it doesn't pass the giggle test it's not small enough and what I mean by that is is that there's a funny um, study that they did on habit change where they got people to develop flossing habits and they had one group and they told them okay, you need to go and floss your teeth every night and we'll follow up with you in three months and see how the habits are getting on. And the other group, they said, just floss one tooth each night and we'll follow up in three months and see how you're getting on. And when they followed up in three months, the one tooth group were much more, were sustaining the habit much better. And the thing is, they didn't necessarily just floss one tooth, but they overcame that friction. They overcame that hump to engagement. They didn't make things too difficult for themselves. And so when they showed up to the tooth flossing party, they thought, well, I'm here now. I might as well, you know, floss another couple of teeth. Yeah. And that's what I mean about laughably small, as in bite-sized habits, small changes are what lead cumulatively to as big results because they give you that boost in momentum. They give you that boost in motivation. They give you that boost in dopamine. They give you that boost in confidence. And actually, those are the things that are necessary. Those are the psychological skills that are necessary to sustain things over time. And then you can ramp up. But ultimately, when it comes to habit change, it's repetition that creates a habit. It's like a series of repeated tasks tells your brain that this is something important to do. And over time, it becomes a non-conscious and non-thinking process. It becomes automatic. Just like toothbrushing, you just do it automatically. But it's not like, you know, we brush our teeth in January loads and our dental hygiene for the year is done. Right. If we're not no longer doing it, it's no longer a habit. And that's why it's so important to start small because small equals success. Yeah, I love that idea of not the idea, the concept of goal dilution. And I think that is so powerful because I always I always tell people like one of my one of my key phrases is that we try we make as humans like I always say, if you want to make something difficult add a human. Because we love to make things complex. <laughs> I love and that. so, you know, I, I don't believe in diets. I don't believe in things. I think complexity is the enemy of consistency. Because mm-hmm. if something is so complex that you can't be consistent with it easily, then it's going to break down and you won't, you won't sustain it long term. And so I think a lot of times as humans, we add so much complexity because it gives us a, it gives us an out because mm-hmm. we can say then like, well, this was so challenging, right? Because mm-hmm. I needed, I needed an abacus. I need a sundial. Like I don't speak, <laughs> I don't speak Portuguese. Like, you know what I mean? I, I can't walk on my hands. Like, you know, yeah. we, we create these like systems mm-hmm. that are so complex that they almost allow us a, you know, a, a lever to pull when things get too challenging. And so mm-hmm. I think the idea, like you said, that giggle test is, so magic and so beautiful because it does have to be granular in order to, and in those, my belief is this, I want you to tell me what you think is that's how you, that's how you create momentum. And I think momentum is one of the most powerful things when it comes Mm -hmm. to making a transformation or making a change or keeping a habit sticky. Yeah, absolutely. 
And I think it's that boost that we need. But the funny thing is, we do the opposite. We come yeah. down hard on ourselves. We tell ourselves yeah. we're not doing enough. We're telling ourselves it's inadequate. We're telling ourselves we'll never be succeed. And the funny thing about that is that creates a cascade of negative emotions and yeah. negative hormones as well. Because dopamine is really key to creating habits. And dopamine is released through positive emotions. So, you know, you have a wonderful conversation with a friend or your child holds your hand or someone tells you, I love you. Or, you know, you scroll through your phone and you see a fun picture. You know, they all give you a dopamine response. And yet by telling ourselves we're not doing good enough, we're not trying hard enough, we could have done less, we could have eaten less, we could have lifted more, we could have X, Y, and Z. That's actually telling our brains and our non-conscious that these are not behaviors that we want to engage with. Yeah. And actually, there's a really interesting researcher that talks about this. His name is BJ Fogg. Um, I don't know if, you, if you've come across his work mm. before, Jay, but um, he talks about you want to create this feeling of shine. And shine is that feeling that you get, like that positive feeling you get. You know, when your team scores in the final minute to win the league, or you get that amazing like amazing car parking space in, in, in the last one that's available right in the store or you know any of those positive things that happen to you you know when you get that positive feeling um you know you lean over and you know see your pad at the end of the day or whatever that creates that positive feeling what we want to do is create that feeling when we're creating our habits and what that does is actually fast tracks our habit success because it's not magic, it's neurochemical because we release that do dopamine hormone. And the dopamine hormone that's released when positive feelings are experienced is a learning hormone. And it tells your brain, let's do this again. This is a good thing to do. So say your habit is to drink more glasses of water. If when you're starting out with your habit, every time you drink a glass of water, you congratulate yourself in some mm. way to create that feeling of shine. So you tell yourself, you know, I'm someone who consistently follows through on my goals, or you draw a smiley face on your to-do list, or you do a drum roll on your desk, or whatever it is, you know, hear trumpets in your head or sing a like a happy song or whatever it happens to be. If you can just reward yourself and create a good feeling within yourself, it trains your brain to be on the lookout for those good feelings. It trains yeah. your brain to actually say, let's engage in this again and again. So it's counter to what we think is going to help us, which is what we, we think whipping ourselves into shape is going to be what we need to do. And actually, that's not effective when it comes to long term change. It's encouragement. It's celebration. It's creating these positive feelings around the habits that we're trying to create. And that's why intrinsic motivation is so important as well. That's what actually leads to long-term success. I love that. In my in my one of my private coaching groups, we have the one of our mantras is we celebrate everything. And so I don't care if it's one day or or one, you know, extra glass of water or one more step or one more mile, mm. whatever it is. Like I'm dead because I the same thing. I want, I want them to learn that those little things matter because like you said, it anchors that we want more of that. And so I yeah. think that's a great thing. I was thinking of a story when you were talking about making those little micro changes about like flossing one tooth. And I wish I could remember where I read the article, but it was about a, a gentleman who wanted to start to go to the gym. And so for the first two weeks, he got up in the morning at the time he was supposed to, got in his car, drove to the gym and didn't go in. He just drove to the gym and then he went back home. And then two weeks later, he drove to the gym, he went in and he stayed for five minutes mm. and then he left and went back home and he did that for two weeks. And then he drove to the gym, stayed for 15 minutes and then did that. And he built that up where it became so easy for him to mm. get up, go to the gym and actually then start to move forward through that, that he was doing that, right? He was teaching himself that you said something earlier about being self-aware. And I think there's mm -hmm. that really plays a massive goal. I mean, role in our success that the more aware you are of what you're doing and why you're doing it, um, mm. it will tend to anchor things deeply or more deeply than if you just kind of go through the motion. So yeah. talk to me about that because I think with habits, sometimes they become so so monotonous or so routine that we don't mm. even we kind of just check the box. Yeah. 
and we yeah. don't really give it the value that it that it deserves in order to keep the habit expanding and growing or be able to do it long term. What do you think? Mm. What's the what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think it's really important because you know we love novelty, uh, and as soon as something becomes more mundane, that's when you know we disengage. And, and, and that's what's quite interesting. And, and it's quite interesting about motivation because our motivation is always really high at the start, but our habit formation is low. And what we want to do is we want to get to this crossover where as our motivation dips, our habit formation takes over. And the thing about habits is they're non-thinking. They're not, they're non-conscious processes. So it's not like we lay in bed this morning, you know, weighing up the pros and cons of dental hygiene or deciding if we're motivated enough to brush our teeth or read like, seven habits of highly motivated toothbrushers in order to be able to do it we did it automatically because it's a habit that we have but what you're asking is well what happens when we get to that small point where we're we're starting to repeat it often enough but we haven't quite got to the have a formation place and I think this is a really interesting crux for a lot of people when it comes to habit change and the key here is if you've got the foundational pieces in place, you will be able to support yourself. So if you understand your intrinsic motivation, and as you said, Jay, like keep that visible, keep that salient, keep reminding yourself of what your why is, you know, and how, what it gives you back. But you can also do that on a micro level with each activity you engage with. So when you drink more water, you think, well, what does this give me back? What well, gives me hydration, gives me clarity, gives me more focus, makes me function better day to day. You can think about that for each of your little um, micro habits that you're creating. Another thing then to do, um, and it's quite important, is to experiment. Because often the reason that we find you know, we go off track is actually because we're not doing the right thing or we're not doing the right thing at the right time for us. And it feels like a slog and it feels difficult and it feels too hard. And so what I say to people who are right at the start of their habit journey is actually think about those habits that bring you joy and start with those first. Yeah. And so if we think about health habits, you know, I ask people, okay, create a joy list. Write down those health habits that bring you joy, be it, you know, you like the fresh crunch of an apple or hiking with your dog makes you feel more alive and refreshed, or even, you know, doing a hit workout with heavy metal music makes you feel empowered and strong. Um, or you can think about how the activity itself will make you feel afterwards. And that's another way to train your brain for rewards. So you can say to yourself, I love that feeling of walking into the house after going for a run at the end of the day. I just feel on such a buzz. I feel on such a high. And when you're considering or you're weighing up, oh, should I go for a run? Should I not go for a run? What they found in studies is if you tune into that post run feeling, those feelings of clarity, of achievement, of accomplishment, that will make it much more likely that you'll actually engage in the activity. And then you can layer in joy too. So if you can think about, well, I'm going to live, listen to my favorite podcast while I do it. I'm going to listen to some epic music or yeah. I'm going to watch Netflix while I batch cook for, for the week or whatever it happens to be. There's ways in which you can tap into joy. It doesn't have to be so hard all the time. Yeah. And so I would say, take it from multiple angles, write down those activities that you enjoy. Think about how you can layer on joy onto your current or existing activities and then look for the joy in the activities look for that end state look for that feeling that it gives you once you've completed this if you can create a craving for that it makes it much more like you're going to engage I love that you said that I was I was had a I had a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with one of my clients um, yesterday and they were talking about how they had kind of fallen out of of habit right mm -hmm. they knew what they were supposed to be doing but they weren't they just weren't doing it and the ones that they were they were just kind of going through the motions it was like Oh, I'm supposed to write down three things I'm grateful for today. So I write down, you know, my family, kids and snowflakes, yeah. like, you know, but, but, but no, there was no emotional feeling tied to Ooh. those things. It was just checking the box and getting through the motions. And they said, well, what do I do? Like, what's what, how do I get back to, to my habits and the routines that I know were bringing me value that I know were still there. I've just kind of disassociated from them and from the practice and I said, I, my suggestion would be to start with those things that make you feel like you want to do more. Mm -hmm. Like, don't start with the things that feel too big and too complex and too overwhelming. 
do the smallest, most micro thing that gives you enough joy and enough happiness that you want to do it again tomorrow. Mm. And then that will allow you to start stacking things upon that. So I, I love the way you articulated that way better than I did. Um, but that, that's no, I, And I think what you say speaks to, um, I think it's James Clear that talks about this as well, like cornerstone habits or keystone habits. Yeah that there's one habit that can often unlock another habit yeah so for example like and I'm sure you you know you'd be a big advocate of this like sleep is one of those things you know when we get good sleep our hormones are regulated better yeah. so we're actually less hungry our motivation is regulated better so we're more likely to engage in our healthier habits or exercise might be one because you know exercise might be something that actually makes you feel like you want to eat healthier or it gives you more energy for your day or your you know your hormones are regulated better that you have less sugar slumps yeah. um and so like there are some key or cornerstone habits that actually can then have this beautiful domino effect on all other habits and so i always say to people if you're going through a difficult period because there are times in life when we're going to be stressed and it, we're going to be depleted and things are going to be hard just cut back to your key or your cornerstone habits, whatever they happen to be. And if you don't know what they are, just make it sleep <laughs> or yeah. just make it exercise because they can have such a positive knock-on effect and a non-conscious effect as well, like a trickle-down effect that you don't really have to force or think your way through. Um, if you just go back to those basics at those times, that can still help you maintain your health no matter what's going on in your life. I love that. So something I've, that jumped off the page to me when I was researching you and, and getting ready for the podcast is you talk about shaking up your habits. Mm. Can you can you dive a little deeper into that for me? Because I, I found that to be fascinating. And I, I want to give you an analogy of what I think you may be saying. So what I've done recently is one of my practices, the first thing I do when I get up in the morning is I, I go to my kitchen and I have a gratitude jar and I'll, I'm have these little cards and I write just, you know, Sometimes I write names or words, or sometimes I write entire sentences, but I found myself, because I, I asked myself a lot of questions and I'm like, okay, Jay, what and why is this still powerful? And are you still using this as a tool to grow as opposed to a tool just to say that you're doing it? Mm -hmm. And I said, so I think the way I could do that is if I paused that particular version of the habit and started working on a new gratitude practice. And so now what I've what I've done for the last six weeks is instead of going and writing it down in the morning, I do my gratitude out loud when I go for my morning walk. And so I just mm -hmm. talk to myself basically about all these, you know, the things that I'm grateful for, but I'm actually articulating it. Is that a version of shaking something up or is that am I totally off base? Yeah. And I, I think this is like advanced habit formation. Um so I think people need to keep in mind that maybe you know, this, this right. can actually happen at yeah. the start and once you've established habit. And what I mean by that is at the start, it's important to experiment because say you want to form a meditation habit and you start by trying to do it every morning for 10 minutes, but the kids are trying to get out the door to school and it's chaotic and you're finding it really stressed. And then you might feel like, oh, I failed on my meditation habit. Well, no, you haven't. It's just not the right time of day for you. So right. you need to experiment to find a different time of day, or maybe 10 minutes is too much for you. Maybe two minutes while the kettle boils is actually going to be a much more achievable thing for you to start with. But then once your habit is established, like you say, like a gratitude practice, and it's something that you're frequently engaging with, it can get to the point where you're just going through the motions and you're not actually still getting that same benefit. That it's important to do a bit of an audit. And ask yourself, well, what function is this serving for me? Right. You know, how is this benefiting me? And if you're still getting a positive benefit from them, then that's absolutely fine. But the habits that are most resilient are those that are flexible. Those that can actually thrive in multiple environments in multiple ways. So when we're starting out, we want to do things at a similar time in a similar context as often as possible. So our brain associates that context with creating the habit. But when we get more proficient, we want to challenge that a little bit. We want to challenge that in a way that when we go away, can we still consistently, you know, execute on our habits? Yeah. Are the habits that we have, are they still serving us in the same way? Exactly like you would with a fitness program. After six weeks, you'd reevaluate. You'd say, am I still getting the same benefits from here? Am I still getting the strength, same strength gains? Okay, maybe I need to cross train a little bit. 
maybe I need to add a bit more variety. And this is where people tend to actually fall down quite often. And it's something that actually you need to think about before you get to that six or eight week mark is what can I bring in that's new or novel or how can I redo this in a different way? And what I mean by that is, you know, if you started a running practice and you know it's 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 going well enough and you're really enjoying it then that's absolutely fine but if you're starting to find it mundane can you take a different route can you go running with a friend how can you do this in a different way but that keeps it interesting keeps it consistent it's the same with eating you know so many people go and they buy you know the most boring foods when they're starting out on a health kick and then six weeks 12 weeks in they find that it gets a bit mundane it gets a bit boring so you need to think about it those things now you know how am I going to shake this up what am I going to do that's new that's novel that's different and then am I still getting the same benefit so the funny thing is with fitness where we tend to be quite good at that we tend to assess you know especially with strength training and and those forms of fitness every kind of 12 weeks three months we tend to step back and assess but we need to do the exact same thing with our other habits because if we're no longer challenging ourselves in a little way we're no longer exactly as you say we're no longer learning we're no longer growing we're no longer strengthening that muscle and it's fine to maintain that's absolutely fine but if you decide well I want to take this to the next level I want to get more high performance habits and um, then you've got to literally you've got to look at well maybe it's five gratitudes instead of three now or yeah. maybe it's actually thinking about it when I'm after just having an argument with my boss or maybe it's thinking about it at a time that's a little bit more difficult for me and you're challenging your habits then and you're actually creating those resilient and those flexible habits so I think what you said is so important and and the way to go about you know overcoming that is a, a thing in psychology we call implementation intentions so it, it, it's basically if X happens, then I will do Y. So if, for example, your habit is to run and then it starts to rain, for example, instead of it being all or nothing and it's, well, if it's raining, I'm not exercising. You've got to ask yourself, well, what happens when it rains? Do I do a strength training for runners workout online? Yeah. Or do I call up a friend and say, let's go tomorrow at another time? You've got to have an alternative plan for when things get monotonous, when things get difficult, when you're in a time of stress. I always say, you know, if you can ask yourself, well, what would my most stressed out, depleted self do in this circumstance? And you can still follow through with the goal, then that's a lasting habit. That's a habit that you've got for life. That's definitely a sticky habit. So it's important to think about these circumstances and ask yourself, what's an extra challenge I can have? But also how can I do this in circumstances that are less than ideal because now I've established a habit let's test it a little bit let's try it out and really get it quite resilient quite flexible yeah I mean you had me thinking so many thoughts when you were you're you going through that that's uh, that's such a great way to articulate that I find that I am really my patterns are really strong my habits are really strong but because of that, I find that I often need a pattern interrupt. Mm. I need something to like, like you were talking about, like that kind of like shocks me out of my normalcy. And so what I do is I travel a lot. And so when I'm on the road, I still work out every day. And I love to, like, I love to go to new gyms and hotel gyms and things like that, because there's variety in that. And then I make it a point not to do the same kind of workout that I would do in my own gym at home mm. or my own studio. And so I find that also refreshes me that when I come back to my studio, I look forward to getting back into that pattern or habit or routine that I had. So I don't think that it, I think it can be used as a really powerful catalyst to keep you engaged in the patterns that you know, that you love, and they're really serving you and giving you their end results that you have. And I love the, if X happens, then Y. I think that's so important because so many people or all or nothing. They're like, you know, oh, well, I was going to go for a run today and it's raining. So therefore I do nothing. Right. Yeah. As opposed to saying, okay, it's raining. Now I'm just going to ride my Peloton instead, mm. or I'm going to like, you know, do a workout online or something of that nature. So I love and that actually, concept. On that point, Jay, actually something that I recently, I just did a, a talk on um, how to find balance in the festive season. 
and and what we got for people we got people to scale all of their habits on a scale of one to ten so if say they were exercise habits or nutrition habits and say 10 out of 10 was to do a strength training and um, workout three times a week well what does a nine look like maybe it's two times a week what does a five look like is that like kettlebells for 10 minutes in the morning what does a four what's a three what's a two what's a one look like maybe a one is just you know five push-ups in the middle of the day because during the fastest season a lot of people feel like their their habits go completely out the window but that's because they're always aiming for these eight nine ten out of tens and they actually don't understand or have ever allow their brain to contemplate what are all the other numbers on the scale because you can still serve your healthy habits you can still serve your value you can still serve your intrinsic motivation it doesn't always have to be a 10 out of 10 and we have to understand that life is not always going to present us with a set of circumstances that we can be 10 out of 10 and so we need to look at all of those factors and I would say to anyone you know, who's trying to create resilient habits is to, if it is a fitness habit, if it is a meditation habit, if it is a nutrition habit, what is the one to 10? So 10 being, you know, your ideal week and then work backwards from there. You know, what's a nine, what's an eight, all the way back to a one. And it could be as simple as I drank, you know, two liters of water today or whatever it happens to be. But it's important to actually look at our habits on a scale because then we can continue to serve. We can continue to create that repetition, even when circumstances are less than ideal. Yeah. You know, something that popped into my brain, and I'm sure you've heard of this. So I people come and they'll say this to me. It's like they'll they'll feel like they ruined everything because they ate one thing that they mm. I'm using air quotes weren't supposed to eat. And so therefore, yeah. then they just destroyed the rest of their day. So because it wasn't a 10, they made the decision to take it from, well, it wasn't a 10, so I'm going to make it a negative 10. And mm. as opposed to just saying, hey, maybe today's going to be a seven, you know, where yeah. I where I didn't eat like I planned to eat, but I can still eat better than I would have. Right. So is that, is that kind of a, an example of what you're, of what that would allow somebody to do if they looked at it from that scale? Yeah, the, absolutely. Actually, I never really thought about it from that direction. Um, but it makes me think of actually a, a study that I did um, as part of my research, which was um, we looked at when people gave into temptation most and why. Uh-huh. Um, and, and that was a beautiful way of actually helping people learn. And so rather than and our conclusion of the study was failure is success if you learn from it. So if you did give in um, on that day, rather than braiding yourself, again, go back to being a habit detective. What made me give in? Did I have an unsustainable breakfast? Did I not eat enough yesterday? Was I feeling emotionally vulnerable? And so I was seeking comfort in food. Was it that, you know, I, someone brought hot cinnamon buns into work and, you know, like what was the circumstance? Because actually, if we can understand more about our temptations, if we can ask ourselves, when and where we give into temptation most and why we can learn a whole lot so actually sometimes those failures or so-called failures can be really um useful in terms of our long-term success because they can teach us an awful lot and like you say you know if we go back to the scaling question say you weren't able to get your three workouts in that week but you were able to get your two out of three workouts in so say you failed on that one day you still understand that actually, well, I'm still going to get 80%. I'm still going to get an eight out of 10 if I go another two times this week. So actually I haven't failed altogether. And we're, we have the propensity to want to throw the towel in. We have the propensity uh-huh. to want to do everything perfect. But actually what we found in our studies is that those were who were the best successful long-term maintainers. So those are people who lost a clinically significant amount of weight and managed to keep it off long-term were flexible in their habits. They did make mistakes and they were able to pick themselves back up and they didn't see it as a personal failure. They saw it as a system failure. And rather than feeling like they had to change themselves, they looked at it like, well, I have to change the system. There's system failure here. It might've been food. It might've been exercise. It might've been emotional. It might've been social, but I'm going to investigate and look at how I approach this situation differently. And in essence, you could say they had a growth mindset about it. They looked at how they could learn what they could grow from that situation. And that's why scaling is so important. That's why going back to our original point, while self-awareness is so important, yeah. but also this investigative, being curious about your habits is so, so important. 
Yeah, that's the word that self-awareness just kept rearing. You know, I kept seeing that word whenever you were talking, because I think the more self-aware you are, the Mm -hmm. the greater the likelihood that you'll have those conversations with yourself. And and I think it's important also to say this is there's no value in in being feeling guilty or beating yourself up or feeling ashamed if you aren't, you know, if you are scaling down that list, right? Mm -hmm. That's I think that's what brings us the most the most problems is our mindset related to those. Cause like you said, if we don't quit, we can't fail. Mm -hmm. And so just because we had a struggle or a challenge, oftentimes we can use that struggle or challenge to actually propel us to be even better than we were before we had the struggle or the challenge. hundred percent. And actually those that were most successful long-term, that's exactly what they did. They learned the ability to learn from their failures or their so-called failures. And then they developed a failure resilience mindset where it just didn't define them anymore. It didn't yeah. become them. And that's a beautiful place to be. And so in a way, you almost want to get excited about when things slip off the perfection yeah. um, you know, scale because then you're learning something and therefore you're improving. And then again, you know, habits are for life, not just for January. And so, you right. know, in order to improve anything, We've got to learn where the mistakes happen. We've got to learn where the failures happen. And um, there was an interesting study on this um, from University College London, where they found that um, those that were most successful at habit change, they were those that were able to fail. Um, they, they, they tended to miss uh, an opportunity once or twice um, a week um, to you know, be consistent on those habits at the start. But the ones that were most successful were the ones that were able to miss one or two, but keep going. And and, and they were the ones that built this failure resilience. So even if you were to focus on just one thing with your habit change, it would be to actually see failures as ways to delve into what's going to take for your long term success and actually be curious about them rather than let them do right. Because they're actually in a way they're kind of gifts in terms of an insight into what is it going to take for a long-term success? You know, I started thinking about this, gosh, this was probably a few months ago. And it was, it was back to the, the question of, well, Jay, how long is it going to take? And I think one of the, one of the challenging things is if you go on social media now, like somebody might say, oh, well, it takes seven days. Well, it takes 21 Mm -hmm. days. And because we're always, everything's marketing, right? So somebody's trying to market to you that it's going to take this specific number of days for you to get a new habit. And so I started writing this. I don't know if it was going to be a blog. I don't know if I'm going to do a podcast on it or what, but I just actually looked at it yesterday and it was how that is such a misleading and and misconceived Mm. thing, because I don't care if it, if it does take, and my philosophy is this, if it matters to you, then it doesn't matter how long it's going to take. Because the value of, of achieving that habit or getting that habit and, and becoming resilient with it will far outweigh the time that it took to get there. But I started thinking, like, I don't even if let's just say that it was 33 days or 66 days mm. or 200 days. During those that time frame, you, you said this earlier, like I said, how did you get to where you are? And you said, well, it definitely wasn't a it wasn't linear. It wasn't a straight yeah. line. Habits are, I believe habits are the, I want to get your professional opinion on this. I believe habits are the same way, like on our, on our journey of the development of a new habit, there's going to be a lot of adversity and challenges mm-hmm. in, in those days where we do fall down and, and, and we have to get back up. And so I think people think, well, then I have to start all over. And I don't believe that. I think it's, it's the journey that, that matters and it's not the the number of specific days. Like, do you see that? Like when people get that mindset of like, well, if it doesn't happen in 21 days, then it's not worth it. Or Mm. what happens if in on day 50 of my 66 day journey that I make a mistake? Like, have I blown my entire likelihood of forming a habit? Yeah. And I think, I think it's uh, something I hear so frequently and it goes back to, you know, the pr- principle that we talked about at the start of, um, you know, today's podcast, which was intrinsic motivation. You know, if your motivation is the number of days, that's not the right motivation. Right. And, 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 and maybe you need to examine, is this the right goal for you? Like, are you truly doing this for you? Because, you know, sometimes it's, it, it's important to let go of developing certain habits. You know, for example, you know, 
I used to tr- run. I used to try and run a lot. I didn't enjoy running. I did it. I'm good at forming habits. I know too much about behavior change. I can do it, but I don't enjoy it. And so as soon as I switched to cycling, I just had a, just a better, more enjoyable life. And why did I think I need to run? Because the media tells us that we need to run or because it's difficult, I felt like I needed to run. Yeah. And I, I think it's important that people understand, you know, it's okay to let go of certain healthy habits or striving for certain healthy habits if they're not the right habits for you. And that's why the joy list is so important because it's like, let's start with those habits that actually bring you joy. Because if you're counting the days, if you're looking at like, okay, you know, I've, I've got to day 14 and it's, and it's the only thing that's keeping you going is the number of days, then that's maybe not the right habit for you or you're not looking at it in the right way or you're not doing it for the right reasons or you might be doing it for someone else. And so it's really, really important that you, any of these habits that you're forming, you're doing it for you and you can really connect with what does it give you back maybe it's not enjoyment maybe it's that that feeling that you get when you come in the door or maybe it is being a positive role model for your children or maybe you just love how you feel when you're out on a bike ride or you love connecting with nature or you love that freedom or you love that time to yourself whatever it happens to be you need to connect with that and those are the habits that you will stop counting the days and just get engaged in the process for what you love now I'll caveat that by saying we often need to try something for a period of time to right. really understand if we like it or not. Right. And so we need to give ourselves that three months just to really kind of bet it in. But if we get to that three month point and we're detesting it, we're hating it, then let's switch it up. Let's change it. And as I said, you know, there's so many ways in which we can serve our health goals, our health values. It just doesn't have to be the gym or nothing. It doesn't have to be, you know, kale salads and steamed fish every night or nothing you know we there's different ways in which we can serve our goals and we have to be again going back to self-reflection we have to look at well what's working for us and what's not and be willing and ready to let go of those things that we don't find joy in and we don't understand or connect with what it gives us back in our life I love that. Some something that I've done, I think this might be valuable to our, our listeners, is you know, I, I mentioned to you, like I started working out when I was in the sixth grade, 48 years old now. And I've done everything. I mean, I've done the most brutal workouts you can imagine. I've tried it, if I've tried it all. And I used to believe my old self and my younger self believed that I had to push myself to extremes, especially Mm -hmm. with like cardio, like I would run and sprint and do, you know, I would put a 50 pound weight vest on and do the stair climber for an hour, like just insane things like that. Now, over about the last year, I've simply started walking for my cardio as opposed to torturing myself because I I made the decision. I'm like, listen, this is the only body you're going to get. If I, you keep torturing yourself, like mm. eventually your knees and your feet and your back are going to make it where you can't do anything. And so I've really ratcheted down my level of what I call it cardiovascular, like running and all that stuff. And I'm in better shape. I'm happier doing it. I love it. I look forward to going on my walks and being in nature and doing all those things. And it's like, so it's like you said, I didn't, I didn't stop doing everything. I just took a bunch of old habits that were no longer serving me. Mm. And I moved them over to a new habit that is now serving me better than those were. Yeah. And I love that. And I think that actually it sparks something else for me that's quite important, which is there's different stages of our life where different habits serve us better. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that's quite important to understand. So for example, like I knew mother or father you know you might not be able to have the same sleep hygiene that you had before although sleep is still always going to be primary if you're striving to have sleep set up in a certain way at that time of your life it's just going to be a stress for you it's not going to be effective and equally like you say you know if you're striving to have high cardio but actually it's not really 
serving you at that time of your life and actually what you need to do is look at well actually long-term joint preservation or long-term health focus you know yeah. it's 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 important to have that ability to kind of step back and say well actually at this stage of my life this habit isn't serving me in the way that it, it did at another stage um and and that's okay you know, and, and I think it's very important to be able to have, again, the reflection, and the yeah. self-reflection. And again, I suppose that's why people work with coaches like you, Jay, you know, because you provide because not, you know, it's not easy to be to self-reflect. You know, we have to yeah. get a good journaling practice. We have to have a, you know, a good critical friend that we can talk to or we have to be really good at voice memoing ourselves and, and, and you know, reflecting over that or we work with the coach and that's what really speeds up that self-reflection muscle um, because they allow us to kind of helicopter out and see things clearly um, and it can really kind of fast track people's success um, but I do think you know with habits it is a process of iteration and experimentation we need to let go of perfectionism and yeah. focus on experimenting and self-reflection and that's really the two key skills and I say ultimately when it comes to habit change you want to focus on skill power not willpower and if we can focus on those two skills I think that we can go a long way to creating those long-term habits I love that now I'm going to ask a completely unfair question because I feel like we you have given so much value and there's you've I mean you've already given so many nuggets that this is going to be completely unfair but I'll, I'll do it anyway <laughs> Um, what is it? well, I mean, it's, it's not even that robust or that, that intelligent of a question. Mm. I just feel like that you've really poured so much value into our conversation today. And I could talk to you for hours about this because I'm so fascinated by, like I said, why humans do what they do. I love to give people like, because that's the question I always get like, Jay, what's the first thing I should do? Like, what's one thing I could do? So what, what would be one suggestion based on all of your experience um, mm. working with a vast amount of humans and from a clinical perspective to just a real world, real life perspective, like what's one thing that, that everybody could do starting now that would, that would bring them some value in the creation of, and like I said, you've already given all these nuggets. So What's one thing that somebody could do that would be that would be beneficial for them? So what I'll do is I'll give you one piece of advice and one action, um, yeah. because the action is something that we've already talked about. Um, yeah. But the piece of advice would be if you're still looking for the secret sauce, it's time to realize that you are the secret sauce. You know, okay. the only one who can change your habits and your life is you so stop looking outside of yourself and start looking inside of yourself because truly you know you intuitively if you peel back the layers you will find the right things for you and you will and you'll find your way and the way to find your way is to find your why so understand why it's important for you to create change in your life and the one piece of advice I would say is start with joy because if you can find joy the rest becomes easy love that i love both of those they're so cool i love that there's no it's cheeky i kind of gave two there sorry no listen i, <laughs> I always do the same thing somebody will say jay can you say one thing and i'm like i don't even have that ability to say one thing yeah. like i'm gonna yeah. i'll try not to say 10 yeah um that's i'm the same way there so we I go totally, i scaled that i scaled that <laughs> i totally get it but you're so right it's like we are enough and we have everything inside of us that we mm. need to create the changes that we desire yeah it's that that quest Step out the, of our own. hey before you go i'd just like to say thank you again for listening to the thrive forever fit podcast and watching on youtube it means the absolute world to me and if you would if you would do me one favor and that is simply subscribe and review this podcast on whatever platform it is that you enjoy it on youtube apple spotify doesn't matter i would absolutely be so grateful and so thankful if you do that for me. Thanks again for listening. And I'll see you again next week with an awesome, awesome episode. Bye.